open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew uh, chapter 7 here this morning. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> we'll start off uh, by reading verse 1, uh, a few verses here. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the beautiful weather outside. The sunshine certainly brightens our day, uh, warms our hearts. Uh, Father, hopefully not as much as the Lord Jesus Christ when we have a chance to sit down and read out of the Word of God. I pray that you would warm the hearts of the folks that are here this morning, that you would help them, Father, in their Christian walk, in their Christian life. And again, if there is somebody here who has never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, I do pray that you would work especially on that heart this morning, that you would convict them that you would convince them of their sin, that you would show them the need for a Savior, and Father, that they would receive salvation. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're back in uh, the beginning of uh, the book of Matthew. Of course, we've been going over uh, the the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about uh, you being the salt of the world. That is, if you're born again here this morning, we talked about that a few weeks ago and went into uh, a lot of things about salt, which I found pretty interesting. We talked about you, if you're a Christian, a child of God this morning, that you are the light of the world. You're really the only light this world has, the only hope that that they have. I mean, without you here, um, people that are lost have nothing to look at, right? Without you here, they're blind. The Lord left you here to be that light. And then we moved on. Oops, I went the wrong way. We moved on and we we looked at... uh, unreachable expectations. We looked at some unbelievable forgiveness the Lord offers and some undeniable love. Just a few more passages in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We finished up that week and we jumped into the requirements for a real relationship. We talked about that last Sunday, the requirements for a real relationship. If you remember, they were having a sincere heart. In other words, what you do, make it real. Right, man? Uh, Don't be fake. Don't be phony. Well, one of the requirements was a single heart. You need to have your eyes focused on somebody, someone individually. Uh, you, can't, you can't really have a real relationship if you have your eyes scattered on too many different things all at once. And then we talked about a secure heart, knowing that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ offers you a, a sense of security like nobody else offers you. Amen? Amen. So today, uh, we're going to move and continue on, and I titled this message this morning, Kingdom Principles to Avoid Christian Casualties. (laughs) Sounds really complicated, amen? Kingdom Principles to Avoid Christian Casualties. Well, you know, what on earth is is that talking about? Um, If you remember, and you can turn a couple pages back in your Bible if you'd like to, but back in uh, John chapter 3, verse 2, you have John the Baptist coming in, or coming on the scene. And John the Baptist, uh, in, in chapter 3, verse 2, Uh, He says this, he says, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, he's going around out in public, walking downtown in the middle of the street, yelling out to all the bypassers there, yelling at them, repent, 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 for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That must have been quite a sight, right? If that wasn't enough, he goes out of town, down by the river, he starts yelling, you know, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist starts off talking about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. And then Jesus continues that thought, if you're looking at your Bible, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 17, and it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount starts in in, uh, Matthew chapter 5, and it starts off at the beginning there, right right away in verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And <clears throat> you may not know this, but the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, just that, that particular phrase, and I know there's mentions of it outside of this, 
uh, you know, this uh, realm that I'm going to talk about, but the phrase, the actual phrase, the kingdom of heaven, only occurs, well, it occurs like 33 times, if I remember right, in 32 different verses. And all of them are in the book of Matthew. Interesting. Just something to think about, right? Um, the gospel of, of Matthew in your Bible, when you get from the, you leave the Old Testament, you get to the New Testament. The first book, obviously, in the New Testament is Matthew. And Matthew heralds the Lord Jesus Christ as the king, right? It establishes his kingly lineage, and it, is, and it, and it, it shows Jesus Christ as a king. And so Matthew presents Jesus Christ as a king. But look carefully, turn if you will to uh, Matthew chapter 11, um, just a few books, a few chapters over from where you're at right now. Matthew chapter 11, and down to verse 12, it says this about the kingdom of heaven, all right? And we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. It says this, and from, because what is the kingdom of heaven? Because we need to kind of establish that. Because John said, behold, the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ started talking about the kingdom of heaven. We read about the kingdom of heaven over and over and over. So in Matthew chapter, chapter 11, it says this. It says, and from, that, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Well, wait a minute. Then the kingdom of heaven must not be a, a, a spiritual thing, right? Right? I mean, I've never yet seen anybody take the heaven up by the North Star by force, right? So we got to thinking about this kingdom of heaven thing. And then, of course, if you read your Bible, you're familiar with your Bible, you look at another phrase in the Bible called the kingdom of God. And a lot of folks think they're synonymous, but they're not. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50, if you have a moment, you can flip over there, or I'll just read it to you. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. In Romans 14, 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's a little bit different, right? Um, in Luke 16, it says, uh, And the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Now, the reason why I'm going into this is the title of uh, the, the message here this morning is, is Kingdom Principles to Avoid Christian Casualties. Now, this looks really complicated, but it's really simple. All right? Uh, and and there, there may be a few adjustments I need to make, but in a nutshell, this is it. So the red line is the kingdom of God. The black line is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is an earthly, physical, visible kingdom that was offered down here on this earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ came and he wanted to establish that and wanted to offer that to the nation of Israel. The kingdom of God is within you. So when it comes to a, a physical kingdom... That kingdom can be taken by force. The children of Israel found that out when Nebuchadnezzar came in. So in a nutshell, oh, I don't have the far left-hand side of this. Um, okay, there's a little bit of a, a discrepancy. Over here, back in Adam and Eve, both kingdoms are on this earth. Just take my word for it. That's what my slide shows. <laughs> but it's cut off here to the left. So Adam and Eve uh, show up in the garden, and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are bas basically both here. Adam's perfect. There's no sin. Everything is, is in sync. Adam sins, and the Lord, um, Adam dies because of his sin, Amen. right? And the Lord leaves the kingdom of heaven down here, and he starts to establishing the nation of Israel. And he builds with the nation of Israel a kingdom on this physical earth, and he offers that kingdom to them if they will follow him, right? So the kingdom of heaven is available. It's a little bit different. The kingdom of God, because of sin has really kind of been taken away for a little while, temporarily. And then Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and the Lord basically says, okay, I'm done with Israel. In 586, or right around there, B.C., the Lord says, okay, I'm done with Israel, and, you know, they don't have the option of the kingdom right now. He sends them into captivity. The nation of Israel kind of gets scattered. Again, this is just kind of a, uh, an overview, all right? I'm sure I could probably find some technical details here that 
but it gives you a general gist of what's happening. So then the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this earth. He was born as a baby, right? When he comes back to this earth, what does he come back for? He comes really to offer to those Jews once again what they had lost back in the captivity. And he comes to deal with the Jews. In fact, he tells the apostles, don't go to the Gentiles, you're, you're here for the Jewish people. And so the Lord Jesus Christ comes and offers to them the kingdom once again. And while he's here, he also is offering them a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. And those Jews, through this time when the Lord Jesus Christ was alive, had the opportunity to really get in on both deals. And they rejected it. They rejected it. So what the Lord did is he stopped dealing with the Jews. So the kingdom of heaven gets out of here. But he kept dealing with the Gentiles. And he offers to us the opportunity to get in on the kingdom of God uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, at the end of uh, the church age, when we're raptured out of here, there's some things that happen. And, um, you know, the Antichrist comes in and there's some jockeying that goes on. But basically, at the, in the millennium, things are going to get back to what the Lord had originally intended and beyond, and that is both of them are going to be here at the same time again. All right? Make a little sense? I Hopefully I didn't uh, blow anybody's mind. Hopefully I got you thinking just a little bit. But it is, uh, it is something to think about. Um, because in John 3, 3, the, Jesus answered and said unto him, that is Nicodemus, right? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Hmm, okay. And then I read this passage in Luke, Luke 13, 28. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourselves thrust out. I got confused. I'm going, in John 3, 3, it says if you're not born again, you can't even see it. But then how do all these other people wind up in it? Scratching my head, right? I'm sitting there yesterday looking, I'm referencing, cross-referencing, and finally I did something that I should have done at the very beginning because I should have known better. I broke out a dictionary. And something that I thought I knew, I learned a little bit more about. I looked up the word see, because I'm thinking, how can they not see it, right? Because I'm thinking, Eyes, see, how can they not see it, but they're there, but they're not part of it, but wait a minute, I'm confused. And I got to looking at it, and to see is, is obviously to perceive by the eye, right? But it is also, there are other definitions of the word see. It is to have experience of. Oh. So now, you shall not see the kingdom of God means a little bit more than just to physically look on it. You shall not have the, to have an experience of. It is to perceive the meaning or importance of. There's just definitions of the word see. You know, sometimes there are contradictions, what you think are contradictions in the Bible, they can really be cleared up by a dictionary. <laughs> Amen? Um, another definition of the word see is to attend as a spectator, as in to see a play. Interesting. Interesting. And that cleared everything up for me. It actually made perfectly good sense. And because I, I got to draw on this chart out, and I'm struggling with those things and looking at them and trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and all it was, brethren, was going to the dictionary and looking up a three-letter word, C, and it made it all fit. It was a beautiful thing. That's really not the subject of the message today. But Matthew 7, take a look back at Matthew 7. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out, out of thy brother's eye. So we um, titled this Kingdom Principles to Avoid Christian Casualties. And that is, I'm going back and I'm looking at some principles that really apply. The Sermon on the Mount, if you want to get real technical 
applies to that black line right there, the kingdom of heaven. All right? But we're going to learn some things, even though we are, we are on the red line in the church age, and I, I put the bottom, the base is where we're, you know, that is earth. Obviously, top it would be not on earth. Um, we're, we're in the red line right now. So we're technically under the kingdom of God because it's within us. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within our heart, dwells within us, right? But I'm going to learn some things from the kingdom of heaven. The Bible's kind of interesting, all right? So we starts off, and you start off, and everybody knows Matthew 7, 1. They all quote Matthew 7, 1. Judge not, lest ye be not judged. All right? So I looked up the word judge. You know what judging is? It is to form an opinion about something or someone after careful thought. After careful thought. Interesting. You read through that passage, you know what you read. You, you do not read that you're not supposed to form an opinion after careful thought, which is how everybody takes the verse. You, you find out you're supposed to form that opinion after careful thought, but be careful because you're held to the same standard, right? And I know you guys know that, and I won't spend a lot of time on that, uh, but 1 Corinthians 10, 15 says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Well, you're commanded to judge, right? Luke 12 says, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. How is it that ye do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? They're getting yelled at for not judging, right? Uh, 1, 1 Corinthians 6 says, do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest of matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? Right? So all those verses. So when you read through Matthew chapter 7, the principle that you learn from here is, is not that you're not supposed to judge. It is that you need to judge after careful thought and consideration because you're held to the same standard. Amen? You're held to the same standard. So then it goes on. And it talks about, verse 3, another famous passage, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? And this is where I really kind of want to start and get, in, get into the main um, gist of the message this morning, and that is kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. All right? If I'm talking about the, the kingdom principle, the kingdom of heaven, which is what these, this section of scripture was given to, that's who it applies to, but I can learn some things from it. And one of the things that I learned from the Sermon on the Mount is, brethren, don't magnify the moat. Amen. Amen? Amen. Don't magnify the moat. You see, you see, we have a tendency in our natural being to look at somebody else and we see a little speck in their eye, a little sliver in their eye, and our natural, our natural tendency is to see how bad that is in their eye. And we forget about the two-by-four sticking out of our own. You know, what, you know what will cause a Christian casualty? Again, principles that we learn from the kingdom. A Christian casualty, brethren, you will become a Christian casualty if you magnify the moat in other people's eyes and in keeping with the whole principles of Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest you be judged, you don't apply the same things to yourself. Amen? Amen. Magnify the moat. We run around with this little microscope or magnifying glass, and we examine other people to see if they live up to our standards or not. Right? We're good about that. We don't even have to try. We do it on accident. We don't even realize it sometimes when we do it. And brother, I'm telling you, if we do that, if we continue to do that, you run around. Listen, if I give you a magnifying glass, for most of you, we don't even need a magnifying glass. <laughs> okay, let's just be real and honest. It's pretty evident where our faults are. Yeah. All right? If I give you a magnifying glass, and we can run around through the congregation, and I stop at each, every, each and every one of you and start looking, everybody else in this building can see a lot of your faults. Amen? It's not that hard to find. 
So what's the point in running around, let me get that moat out of your eye? Because obviously, you have a problem. And you forget about yourself. Amen? You forget about yourself. Listen, I see this happen so often in churches. I see it happen with people complaining about other people's kids. I can't believe they would let their kids do that. I never let my kid do that. I've heard my mom say that. <laughs> I've heard my own mother say, well, when I was raising you boys, I never let you do that. And I'm sitting here in the back of my mind going, yeah, you did. <laughs> you know, the memory fades after a while. We kind of view things through uh, rose-colored glasses, shall we say. <laughs> and I love it when she does that because it's always hysterical. My wife always looks over at me and goes, <laughs> Right? Listen, what are we talking about? We're talking about some kingdom principles that will avoid Christian casualties. One of the things you've got to watch for, one of the things you need to be careful for is running around with a magnifying glass and looking at somebody else and what they're doing and how they're raising their kids or what they're doing. And, and, and you, become, you become the arbitrator of everything that's good and right and just and perfect because obviously you did such a great job. And your kids never had any of these problems. Like my mother. My mother never had those problems with us. Look at how I turned out. <laughs> Come on. Of course, what was I thinking? She was right all along. Listen. Kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. You've got to be careful about that moat. Right? you got to be careful about that moat. Listen, not only, not only do we find ourselves sometimes complaining about other children's, but listen, we criticize someone when they're a casualty. We got this magnifying glass out, and we take a look at them when they've fallen, when they've stumbled, when they've made a mistake, when they've been, you know, they're down. And you know what we want to do? <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Tried to warn you. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> You say, I would never do something like that. Oh, yeah, you do when you talk about them. Amen? When you talk about them, you kick somebody when they're down. Okay, kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. Listen, there are some things that are just common among men, and we have a proclivity to make these mistakes. And one of the things that we tend to do is we tend to see somebody that is down and you know what? The, the ugly, ugly truth is to make ourselves feel <clears throat> a little better, we point out why they're lying there on the floor. And if, if you could just view it from the Lord's perspective, if you could just view it from the Lord's perspective, where he sits back and looks at you and says, I see you kicking brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so there, but I know a few things about you. Listen, brethren, your, our attitudes would change. Your attitude would change. Right? The moat that is in thy brother's eye. You get the magnifying glass out. Oh, that's why he fell. I would never do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> all right? Galatians 6 1 says, Brethren, I better hurry. If a man be overtaken, I'll stay here all day. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one the spirit of meekness. You know the verse, right? Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. See, the principle in Matthew 7 is not that you're supposed to eliminate all judging. The principle in Matthew 7 is when you judge, judge righteously because you're held to the same standard. Right? And don't go looking for those minute little problems when you've got some pretty big problems of your own. All right? Complaining about others' children. Listen, criticizing a casualty. How about just critiquing another Christian? Right? Matthew chapter 7. Well, you should do this. 
blah, 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 whatever it is. We pipe up sometimes and we say, well, I just don't agree with the way brother so-and-so does this or sister so-and-so does that. I just don't agree with my parents. I think they're wrong. I've seen people do this with their Sunday school teachers. Yes, I've seen people do this with the pastor. I know you guys would never do that. Because after all, I learned the lesson from my mother and she didn't make any mistakes, right? Well, I just don't agree with brother so-and-so. I just don't agree with sister so-and-so. And, and you get the magnifying glass out. I don't like the way they do this. Ah, it just annoys me when they do this. And the Lord's looking up there from heaven going, you need to move the two-by-four out of your eye. Because you've got a magnifying glass looking at a little sliver in somebody else's eye. But I see the beam in your eye. Christ, uh, kingdom principles to prevent Christian casualties, to, to avoid Christian casualties. Listen, brethren, if, if you, you get too used to that magnifying glass, it becomes your, your tool of default where you're looking at other people, looking at other people, magnifying just to see what's wrong down there. And yes, I see it. I see the splinter in their eye. Your focus is all off. And listen, you will be the casualty, not the one with the sliver in their eye. You got it? The Lord knows how to take care of slivers in someone's eye. The Lord can take care of that. Listen, I've seen people, I've seen people do this in, in churches across this country and it, it, it tears things apart and I've seen Christians do it to other Christians and brethren it just it, it's a never ending cycle and they never seem to realize that what they're magnifying the Lord is saying oh okay you want to point that out in somebody let me talk to you about it but they don't hear that part I just have a few things to um uh, a few questions to ask about, you know, that matter. And that is this. You stand up and you say, I don't like the way sister so-and-so does this. I don't think it's right brother so-and-so does this. I don't agree with, I don't agree with this. I have a question. I, I, I really, I don't say this to be mean. I say this to provoke and make you think. Amen. Because we can all make that same mistake, all right? You're no different. You can make it too, believe it or not. Amen. I know your mother probably doesn't think so. <laughs> but trust me, just like my mother, she's deluded. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Why do you think you're right anyway? Amen? Amen? Yeah. Why, why do you think you have the corner on the market of the way brother or sister so-and-so should be doing things? That's a good question. You get so focused on the way they're doing things, you look at it and you, judge not lest you be judged. And you forget, whoa, with what judgment I judge, that's the judgment with which I'm going to be judged. Amen. Listen, who said you had to agree anyway? You say, well, I disagree with the way brother so-and-so does this or sister so-and-so does that. So? I can go back to fifth grade if you want me to drop it down a level. Remember that? See any concern in this eye? <laughs> How about this one? <laughs> See, we, we think so highly of ourselves, we think that if we think that, everybody else should. But brethren, that's not necessarily the case. It's not necessarily the case. We're, we're straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Right? I mean, that's the Bible definition, right? Who said you had to agree? Everybody has to do the things the way you think they should do them? Really? <laughs> How's that working for you? Let me ask. <laughs> right? Who said you get to decide? It's a good question. And let me ask one more simple probing question heart dissecting question. 
Why should someone listen to you anyway? I mean, look at your life. All the, all the successes, all the failures, everything that a lot of people are very well aware of, why should they listen to you? Do you really think that you are at that much of a higher level that you have been given some special revelation by God to do this? See, kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. What's the problem? The problem, the problem is we get the magnifying glass out and we like the magnifying glass. But we never look in the mirror. And what does it do, brethren? It destroys the people around you, but in the end, it destroys you too. And so the Lord sits down with his disciples and he says, oh, whoa, 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 be careful. When you get to, the, uh, when you get to this whole thing about judging, be careful because there's some, there's some stipulations on it. When you start to hold somebody up to a particular standard, you got to make sure you're under the same standard. And the truth of the matter is, brethren, it's not your standard. It's not how sister so-and-so does something or how brother so-and-so does something or how the deacons do something or the Sunday school teacher does something or the pastor does something. That's not the issue. Get your eyes off of them altogether. It's how the Lord wants it done. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's, it's, listen, we're, we're here not to please, the, you guys aren't here to please me. I mean, I'm happy you're here, right? Gives me warm fuzzies and I yell over and I get, you know, all kind of mushy and emotional. I was going to cry here in a second. No. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. It's a blessing to be together. But, but brethren, as much as, as much as I love you, as much as I hope you love me, you're not here for me. You're here for the Lord. Amen. Right? It's the Lord that sets the standard. It's the Lord that determines what's right and wrong. It's the Lord that determines what course of action that brother or sister should take. Who are you and I to get in the way of that? Be very careful when you break out the magnifying glass. Doesn't say don't judge, okay? But you got to be very careful. And we're all too quick to grab the magnifying glass and start looking. All too quick. Um, I think it was F.B. Meyer that said this. Um, he said, when we see a brother or sister in sin, there are two things that we do not know. First, we do not know how hard he or she tried not to sin. That's pretty good. And second, we, don't, we do not know the power of the forces that assailed him or her. Or a third question, or what we would have done in the same circumstance. Amen? Listen, the whole, the whole point is judge yourself first. Take care of the moat in your own eye. Kingdom principle that will prevent a lot of Christian casualties. Ironside, I don't know if you know who Ironside is, but he was a, a Bible commentator. He wrote, he's got a real famous uh, comment, commentary series on the Bible. But he, uh, he was relaying a story of uh, a Bishop Potter, who was you know, an old-time gentleman. Bishop Potter was sailing to Europe on one of the great uh, transatlantic ocean liners. When he went on board, he found that another passenger was to share the cabin with him. After going in to see the accommodations, he came up to the purser's, purser's desk and inquired uh, if he could leave his gold watch and other valuables in the ship's safe. He explained that ordinarily he never availed himself of that privilege, but he had been able, or he had been to his cabin and had met the man who was to occupy the other berth, and judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be a very trustworthy person. The purser accepted the responsibility for the valuables and remarked, it's all right, Bishop, I'll be very glad to take care of them for you. The other man has already been up here, and he left his stuff for the same reason. <laughs> it's about the way it goes, right? I mean, I'll even concede... You get out that magnifying glass, you start looking, and you see that moat. And you know what? The moat really is there. But that's not the problem. The moat may really even be there, but that's not the problem. Amen? Amen? All right, I better get rolling. <laughs> Take a look in Matthew chapter 7 again. 
Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rent you. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. All right, don't discard to the dogs. You say, discard what? Ha! Huh. Well, I'm glad you asked. Your purity. Listen, the world is out to assail you. The world is out to get you. The world is out to, to uh, ruin your life. Listen, don't give over to this world your pure motives, your pure thought, your purity. And I'm talking the whole realm of things. Amen. Yeah. Amen? Don't discard the things the Lord has given you and throw them before the dogs because they'll take them and, and eat them up. The world would love to just get a hold of them. Rip them apart. That's what they would love to do to you. Listen, don't discard to the dogs. Don't take the valuable things the Lord has given you and who the Lord made you, and don't take what you have to offer and give it to the dogs. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve it, right? Your purity, protect it. Purity of body, purity of mind. The things that you filter through your head, the things you think about, the things that you watch, the things that you get involved in. Listen, protect your purity. Why? Because you don't want to take that thing that the Lord gave you and who the Lord made you for his service and for his glory and throw it to the dogs. Right? Kingdom principles... To avoid Christian casualties. Because if you throw enough of your stuff to the dogs, there's nothing left, brethren. There's nothing left. Right? Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. You've been saved? You've been born again? Listen, you're holy. You're holy. Don't give your purity to the dogs. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 14, you know the verse, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise, us, raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. It's in kingdom principles. Don't take the valuable things the Lord has given you and throw them out to the dogs because this world will just tear them up. And it's, Sometimes there's an attraction to it because we don't realize. We don't realize what's really out there. I'll move on. Don't discard to the dogs your purity, but don't discard to the dogs your passion either. Listen, preserve it. What do you love about life? Right? What motivates you? What, what things drive you? When you, when you think of things that, that, you know, that flip your switch, what are they? Hopefully they're not the things of this world. And you've taken all that, that passion, that desire that should be used towards serving our Lord Jesus Christ and towards glorifying him. You've taken all that and you've thrown it on soccer? Golf? Scuba diving? <laughs> <laughs> Judge not, lest ye be not judged. <laughs> Brethren, I ask myself that all the time. I have to, because I can't stand up here and tell you and expect you to say, listen, control your, your passions, control your desires, control, you know, control, 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 and I can't go out and just completely lose control. Amen. Why? Oh, thou hypocrite, <laughs> right? Get rid of your magnifying glass, Bob. <laughs> I heard that from the Lord a couple times. Him and I, we have good conversations. I hope you do too. Amen? Because kingdom principles, these kingdom principles will avoid Christian casualties, brethren. Right? Don't, don't discard your purity, your passion, and throw it to the dogs. Right? Cast your pearls before swine. Don't discard your pennies. Listen, what do you do with your money? The money the Lord's given you, the money the Lord's blessed you with, the money the Lord has, has, has put into your, your possession and your care, how do you take care of it? Or do you discard it to the dogs? See, if you keep throwing it to the dogs, 
you're not going to be able to do something with it that really needs to be done for the kingdom of God. Amen? I mean, kingdom principles that, to avoid Christian casualties. Don't discard what the Lord has blessed you with to the dogs. Now, I know, I know the perception of what's out there. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. It's so cute. Come on, it'll be so much fun. That's what the world says. Right? The world allures you in because it's so cuddly, it's so attractive. Right? And sometimes we get fooled. We get fooled by that. And that's where you wind up, brethren. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Right? Don't cast your pearls before swine. Listen, the Lord's given you something very valuable. Give not that which is holy to the dogs. You have something in you the Lord desires to use and to nurture and to protect and to grow and to bless and because a puppy has a cute little face at the beginning, sometimes we throw that part of ourselves away. And we, we lose out, brethren. We lose out. Kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. All right? Watch out with a magnifying glass. Don't magnify the moat in somebody else's eye. You've got plenty to worry about in yourself, okay? Don't discard this precious thing that the Lord has given you. Don't discard it to the dogs, right? Your purity, your passion, your pennies. Don't discard it. And finally, finally, take a look at verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would do that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Listen, we all know that game of hide and seek, right? You ever play hide and seek? I love playing hide and seek with the grandkids. They're great. But there's some things. You know what makes the young kids really upset when you go to play hide and seek with them? When you mess up the counting. They get all excited. They're ready to go. And then you sit down there and you, you lay on the couch, you put your head in the pillow, and you go, one, one and a half, <laughs> two, Papa, no, count right. <laughs> right? Well, you know what? That's kind of like how we are sometimes with the Lord. We drag it out, drag it out, drag it out before we go seek him. Right? Sometimes we, we're so used to handling things on our, by ourselves, we forget, listen, I need to go to the Lord right away. Amen. I need to get the Lord's, I need to go seek the Lord right away. Right? I need, I need to find out what his viewpoint on this is, not what my viewpoint on this is. Listen, we need to ask. I mean, you know the passage in James, from whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Yeah, they do. <laughs> ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot attain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting up in heaven right now, watching you struggle with everything that you're struggling with. And he's just waiting, just waiting for you to seek him and ask him. 
Amen? Just waiting. But we don't ask. Sometimes, brethren, we don't ask. We just, we just go on about our business. We don't ask. Listen, you may be here this morning, maybe you're unsaved. Maybe you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Why? Because you've never taken the time to just simply ask. You've got all these plans, all this great religious course that you want to take, but you've never sit and taken the time, you've never sitting back and taken the time to go to the Lord Jesus Christ and just ask to have your sins forgiven. Just ask for Him to come into your heart, be your Savior. Just ask for Him to forgive you for all the things that you've done. Just ask for Him to take what He... Uh, paid for on Calvary's cross the blood of his son Jesus Christ and apply it to your sins just ask for all those things but all too often we don't get it because we don't ask for it we don't get it because we don't ask for it listen seek right once you ask the Bible says in 7 7 the verse we're looking at here ask and it shall be given you seek and ye shall find. And then, of course, it says what? Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Listen, when you ask the Lord for things and, and you're struggling, salvation is easy. You ask, boom, he gives it to you. Some things in the Christian life you ask the Lord about, and you have to seek. You have to look. You have to go up to that door and knock on that door. Right? Boot camp. When you want to talk to the drill instructors, you got to walk up to the door. Boom, boom, boom. Right? Slap three times on the wall. Sir, Private Grissom requests permission to speak to the drill instructor, sir. <laughs> you got to knock. Why? Because that's how he knows you're at the door. Right? But all too often, all too often, all too often, brethren, we just. We play hide and seek with the Lord. And the Lord's looking around the tree waiting for us to get through counting. <laughs> Four and a half. <laughs> Five. <laughs> and you watch little kids play hide and seek, and if the person counting takes too long, they really get impatient. <laughs> right? Kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. Listen, ask, man. The Lord is there for you. He desires to have that fellowship with you. He waits and longs for you to just come to him and ask. And he'll be there for you. But all too often, we don't do that. All too often, we fail to ask the Lord. We fail to seek him. We fail to knock at the door. Listen, we'll... I knew there was no way I was going to get through the whole chapter here tonight, so I decided to stop right here. Kingdom principles to avoid Christian casualties. Simple things, brethren, you and I can do that we learn from the Sermon on the Mount that will help us in our Christian life. Careful with the magnifying glass. Oh, brethren, right? If you want to use a magnifying glass, here's how you use it. Take it to the mirror and look in the mirror because it'll make everything on you bigger. You know, the, and the women, you know, uh, uh, they have these uh, vanities. I saw one. And it's on the swinging arm. It's a mirror, but it's magnified mirror. You can swing it out. And it's like, whoa, put that thing back. Because <laughs> a lot of times you don't like what you see. So you cover it up with makeup. <laughs> Guys, we're just too hard-headed to care. It's like, oh, oh well, it doesn't get any better than that. But, but you want to use a magnifying glass? Look at yourself. You know what? You'll, you'll avoid a lot of Christian casualties. And one of them may very well be you. Okay? Don't discard your purity, your passions, your pennies. Don't discard those things to the dogs. The world would love to take them from you and trample them underfoot. 
okay? And don't hide and not have because you simply didn't go to the Lord and ask and seek. Amen? I mean, he's waiting for you. He's there. I can't promise you he will answer yes to the questions you want to ask and you hope he says yes to. He may say no. But I promise you, if he says no, you're far better off taking a no than trying to force a yes without him. Okay? Amen? Don't, don't hide from the Lord and miss out on spiritual blessings because you simply don't seek him and ask for him. Amen? Kingdom principles to help avoid Christian casualties. Let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for uh, the Bible. I certainly appreciate these folks being here this morning. Uh, Lord, these are simple principles that uh, in one form, fashion, or another, uh, Lord, we hear all the time, and we know them, but Father, sometimes it's just good to sit back and be re reminded once again of just how critical and just how important those things are. You, uh, you took your disciples apart from everybody else, took them up on a mountain, sat them down, and Father, you taught them. And the things that you taught them were important, were critical, were foundational to those disciples getting ready to head out and spread the gospel throughout uh, the whole world, really. And Father, these are the principles that you taught them. I pray that you'd give us a, an understanding of just how important they are. Lord, help us not to um, search our brother's eye for a, a moat when, Lord, there's plenty of beams in our own eye. Help us, Father, not to discard the valuable things that you've given us about ourselves, our life, our, our possessions, our blessings, and take those things and cast them to the dogs. Lord, what a tragedy and what a waste. And Father, help us not to hide from you, but help us to seek you and ask. Uh, Lord, you're the creator of the universe, and there are so many things that are just out of our control, but they're not out of your control. Give us a, a, a prayerful heart, Father, and a heart that would not only seek after our God, but that would be in fellowship with and would ask our petitions before him directly. And I pray, Father, if there's somebody here who's never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save them, that, Father, this morning they would just simply ask. And I know the Bible says that you will hear. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.